Our final lecture today on culture is going to be about Pierre Bourdieu. And I am going to focus on two things within Bourdieu. One, to give you a rough outline of his overall set of ideas. And two, to emphasize how within Bourdieu he thinks about culture as being intimately tied to or even creating of inequality. So Pierre Bourdieu was a French social scientist who began writing in the 1960s and um, wrote for a little over 40 years and created a huge amount of work and today is one of the most influential social scientists. Um, He passed away um, in the early 2000s. And Pierre Bourdieu created um, a trinity of interlinked concepts for understanding how culture works and really how society works. And for Bourdieu, one of the central functions of culture, and I use that word very purposefully, and we'll talk about why in a little bit, was to think about how culture works to legitimate differences and reproduce social hierarchies. So Bourdieu thinks about the function of culture as partially the legitimation of difference and the reproduction of hierarchy. In this sense, culture for Bourdieu is very much about inequality. So in the first lecture on culture, I said culture and inequality are going to be tied to one another. And in this lecture, I want to explain how that might be seen, how it is that we might understand that. Now, there are three concepts that Bourdieu develops that are important for understanding this. Fields, capitals, and habitus. So habitus, by the way, um, uh, this is kind of a strange aside, but it's helpful maybe for some of you. The plural of habitus is habitus. So the word is the same in the singular and the plural. And this conceptual apparatus of field, culture, and habitus, um, I mean, excuse me, field, capital, and habitus, um, uh, Bourdieu uses in a wide variety of contexts, but I'm going to focus on one kind of capital today, and that's cultural capital. So cultural capital are the non-economic resources um, attuned to a particular sphere of social life, which can include institutional, embodied, or objectified cultural capital. And if you're confused, don't worry. I'm going to spend some time trying to explain this. So capital is a fancy way of saying resource. Um, So economic capital is a monetary resource. It's something that helps you on markets, in markets. So economic capital allows you to buy certain kinds of things. You can buy some things versus other kinds of things in markets, depending upon how much money that you make. But it's important to note that like what you buy may be quite distinct from what other people buy, even if you're spending the same amount of money. So think, for example, of your friends for a moment. So imagine your friends, and imagine they each have some small amount of money. It doesn't have to be a huge amount of money. And ask yourself, what would different friends buy if they all had the same amount of money? Some of them might buy nothing and be very interested in saving. Others might say, actually, you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to take us all out and like we can go have like a snack or a meal together. Wouldn't that be fun? Others are going to buy some music (coughs) and a particular kind of music. Excuse me. Others may buy a piece of clothing. The sets of choices that they make in some ways reflects their status orientation, but also some of their cultural dispositions. Or another way of thinking about this is that having a certain amount of money doesn't determine what you buy. It determines what you can buy. But what you buy may be as important as what you can buy. Maybe not, but maybe. So think for a moment about things that are very expensive. So um, let's say I'm thinking for a moment about a really, really expensive sports car. So, you know, I'm from the United States. I don't know how much a really expensive sports car is. It's not really something that's of interest to me. Um, But let's say it's like $200,000. 
So I can buy a super, super expensive supercar for $200,000 and I would be super excited to do that. But I could buy other things with that money. I could buy, almost absurdly, I could buy a chair. One chair for $200,000. Now, this would certainly be a very special chair, but its specialness might be lost on lots of people because the specialness of the chair is likely that it was produced at a certain period in time by a particular kind of person or by a specific person. So chairs that were finally produced in the 1700s in the United States can cost up to $200,000, the same amount of money as the sports car. Some of us would rather own the sports car. Some of us would rather own the chair. Some of us would rather have neither. What this points to is that having a lot of money or having money at all that you can dispose of in markets doesn't determine how you dispose of it or what you dispose of. What determines that set of things are your tastes or dispositions, your knowledge and your behaviors, your general orientation to the world. Now, Weber partially made this distinction when he thought about different status groups, where different groups would represent themselves in different ways. And um, uh, maybe less grandly in terms of social theorists, you know, we have a colloquial or everyday sense of this, by which I mean we think about how it is that like new rich people maybe, you know, buy really dramatic things like a Rolex watch or diamonds, whereas other kinds of people buy less dramatic things. And even describing it as dramatic as a judgmental way of thinking about people's different consumption patterns. But for a lot of thinkers, including Bourdieu, these consumption patterns aren't just choices that we make, but they're structured choices. Yet again, we return to the insight that there are a set of social structural conditions that produce the conditions for action, that produce a likely set of activities that then reproduce the structures. And importantly, that the way in which we act in the world and the sets of knowledge, skills, and dispositions that we have don't just reflect who we are, but they serve as a kind of resource. So I want to return us to the earlier lecture on classical music. Um, Well, it wasn't a lecture on classical music, but a lecture where I brought up the issue of classical music and highlight something about um, that uh, um, uh, moment of, uh, of discussion. Having classical music tastes can be a reflection of your social structural position, but it can also be a resource in and of itself. Because insofar as you have those tastes, people view you in a particular way and it comes with some value. Culture then is not just a reflection of who we are. It is in Bued with or laden with value. And just as money might exist in your wallet, you might also have cultural resources. Resources where the cultural tastes that you have represent your social position, but also can be deployed to advantage you. Cultural capital, then, is the set of ways in which culture broadly defined, has a similar function as money. It helps generate opportunities for you, or it can result in a series of constraints upon you. Having the right cultural match, for example, is really important. Lauren Rivera is a social scientist um, who teaches at Northwestern in the business school and does really interesting work work on what she calls cultural matching. The idea of cultural matching is that when you apply for a job, they don't just look to see what your skills are. They often look to see, do you match culturally with the firm? In this sense, having the right culture or a culture that matches with an institution can advantage you. It is like money that helps you get things for yourself. Bourdieu then says, 
Economic capital is super important, but so too are other kinds of capital. And one of the ones that he focuses is cultural capital. So Bourdieu argues for the importance of economic social capital, which is who it is that you're tied to or the networks that you have, cultural capital, which are the set of cultural resources that you have, and symbolic capital, the symbolic resources that you can draw upon. For now, I just want you to think about cultural capital of these four. And cultural capital are the non-economic resources, the knowledge, skills, and behaviors that are attuned to a particular sphere of social life, which can include institutional, embodied, or objectified cultural capital. So again, what does this mean? I just repeated the same definition after all of these examples. Well, it means that like, In school, one of the things that you develop is knowledge, maybe about particular subjects, but you also develop other kinds of knowledge, knowledge that is cultural, and that that cultural knowledge may help you. It may be a kind of resource that gives you access to opportunities. So what is it that schools do? Well, they partially tell you particular things, but they also produce within you ways of being ways of thinking, ways of knowing, ways of acting that help match you with particular kinds of future institutions. So if you ever walked into a space and felt really uncomfortable, one of the things that's happening is a lack of a cultural match between the cultural expectations of the institution and the cultural sensibilities or dispositions that you've developed. And so sometimes when we enter a new school, we're like, wow, I don't really feel that comfortable here. Part of it is that there isn't that cultural match. Essentially, such cultural matching is a deep part of inequality. Because one of the ways in which we are successful, successful within markets, is having the right kinds of cultural matches between us and often powerful institutions. And more advantaged people typically have greater degrees of cultural matching between themselves and those powerful institutions. That is, more pow- that, that when we have access to opportunities, often it's not just because of the human capital that we have, the particular things that we know, But instead, it's also the cultural resources that we bring to bear that allow us to be successful in situations. Now, when I say that this happens, this cultural capital is deployed in particular realms or areas of social life or spheres, what I'm pointing to here is partially Bourdieu's ideas of fields. And fields are contexts of social relations wherein a particular kind of capital is engaged, so profession, a community, or a class of people. As an example, there's like, there are educational fields. And in educational fields, there are different kinds of capital that are important. Um, there are cultural fields, like the fields of music is a cultural field. And in that cultural field, it's defined by a range of capitals that are important to that field or that space. Bourdieu thinks about the world as a series of fields or a series of spaces where we all struggle with the resources that we have in order to advance our social positions. Bourdieu is essentially a theorist of power and struggle, of how it is that we deploy the resources that we have available to us to constantly advantage our position. And the terrains of that struggle are multiple. Sometimes there are schools, sometimes there are culture, sometimes there are markets, sometimes there are law. Those different terrains are fields. So there are fields that are defined by the struggles that happen relative to the capital that we each have, where we seek to deploy our available resources, be those cultural resources or economic resources or symbolic resources or social resources, like the people that we're tied to in order to advance ourselves. Finally, Bourdieu adds to this a third layer, which is habitus. Habitus are our learned dispositions, the tendencies of how we act and see the world, deeply intertwined with culture, I mean, with capital, 
and with fields because people in different positions develop different dispositions. I want to give just sort of two quick examples of this. Um, the first example is an example of like eating a meal. And eating a meal seems super simple. We all eat all the time, right? Maybe not all the time, but we most of us eat about three times a day. And so there shouldn't be anything particularly complicated about eating a meal. It's required for us in order to survive. And yet different kinds of meals require different kinds of eating. And we may be more or less comfortable with different situations of eating a meal. So if you've ever sat down in a very formal restaurant, you might feel either totally at home or really uncomfortable. And that feeling or disposition is part of the ways in which you represent yourself or you have an embodied set of dispositions called, in Bourdieu's sense, a habitus. Bourdieu wants to focus our attention to the fact that our bodies are, in his words, like a memory pad. Our bodies reflect and remember the sets of experiences that, that we've had, and they help reproduce those experiences through a set of internalized or embodied dispositions. So why is it that some people are comfortable at really formal restaurants? Because their bodies are memory pads because they've actually had lots of experiences in those kinds of restaurants or similar sets of spaces, and they know how to act and how to navigate those spaces. In this sense, their internalized dispositions reflect their former institutional experiences. I'll say that again. Their internal, their, their overall dispositions are an internalization of past experiences. Think about school for a moment. You, have, you may have some friends who are super, super adept at moving throughout school and others who are super uncomfortable. And rather than just think about that as an element of their personality, what it is that they're like, what if you thought about that as a system of inequality where some people have had a lot of experience in similar kinds of schools before and they just know how to act, they know how to play the game and other people have not had that experience and it's actually deeply unsettling. In this example, then, tied to the restaurant example, your capacity to eat a kind of meal is in part conditional on the past experiences that you've had and the internal dispositions that are represented in your bodily dispositions. It's not just a formal restaurant where this happens. You could imagine also going to a deeply informal or casual restaurant in a particular place where the eating requires something very different. So maybe I'm an American, I would go to like a NASCAR rally, which is a particular kind of sporting event. And at that NASCAR rally, there's a way in which you order food and drink things, and it requires a certain kind of corporeal capacity to know how, what to order, how to order it, how to eat it, how to do so comfortably. And some people may do so in a really poor way. They might ask, is there a knife and fork for this burger? Or, you know, could I have a particular kind of napkin and, you know, sit down and place it on their lap in a very formal way? They would sort of not really have the right set of dispositions, bodily dispositions in order to eat that meal. This idea of habitus, our learned dispositions of the ways in which past institutional experiences imprint themselves upon our bodies and produce the ways in which we act, again, reflects how structures produce the conditions of agency and that agency reproduces structural conditions. And it also helps explain why some patterned inequalities seem so natural. Some people seem like they just have what it takes. They just have the right set of dispositions, the right kind of orientation, to successfully navigate institutional environments. But from Bourdieu's perspective, that's not quite right. People's capacity to navigate fields and institutions is built upon the set of capitals that they've developed over the course of their life, that is the resources and skills that they have, as well as their dispositions, their bodily ways of moving through the world. Importantly, for all of us, our dispositions just seem natural. They just seem like, well, this is the way that I am. 
This is the way in which I orient to the world. It's just who I am. But in Bourdieu's sense, insofar as those dispositions are part of the bodily memory pad, a memory of past experiences, if you've had certain experiences, they're going to serve as resources for other future experiences. Spending a lot of time at elite schools is going to help you in terms of your overall disposition, navigating subsequently maybe elite employment environments. And so in this sense, we can begin to see how culture cultural dispositions that begin to be imprinted upon people's bodies serve as a crucial basis for understanding systematic inequalities within a society.